webinar. Um, welcome everyone to Educate Next by Ambry Genetics. I'm Michael List, your moderator today. I'm one of the managers of quality and I focus on regulatory affairs at Ambry Genetics. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rashid Karam, who will be discussing RNA sequencing as a complement to genetic testing. As a note, this is the last webinar for the 2018 calendar. We are finalizing the schedule for 2019 and we'll be releasing it to everyone shortly. We hope you join us next year. Some reminders. Some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk email folder. Add us to known senders to ensure that you're getting all of the relevant updates. For continuing education units, only the live session qualifies for CEUs. Attendance through the GoToWebinar link and the survey at the end of the webinar are required to qualify for CEU. For certificates, uh, we do provide certified GCs, NSGC CEUs, and they are awarded on a quarterly basis. It's better, it's better to register with your personal email to ensure that you receive the certificates in case if you change jobs. Provide your NSGC user ID number on the survey. If you are not an NSGC member, you must create a guest account. Licensed CLSs, we also provide PACE certifications, one certificate per session. Um, they're available approximately four weeks post-session. You must keep track of your participation to verify that the CEUs earned are correct. Some logistics for today's webinar. You were automatically muted when you joined the webinar and the session is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website. The control panel appears on the right side of your screen. From the grab tab, you can hide the control panel or view the webinar in full screen. For questions, you can enter questions on the questions pane. You can ask questions at any time, but all questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. The evaluation pops up in a web browser after the presentation. When you close the webinar window, also by email, approximately an hour after the presentation, um, you will need to complete one. It will not ask for your name as you already logged in with the name that you used during the registration. Please complete the evaluation soon after the webinar so you are included on the attendees report when we download it in the next couple of days. We cannot add you afterwards. With that, um, I'd like to introduce again, Dr. Rashid Karam. Rashid obtained his medical degree in Brazil at the Federal University of Health Sciences of Porto Alegre. Rashid also has a PhD in oncogenetics and did his graduate studies on the role of the nonsense mediated mRNA decay pathway in the regulation of the CDH1 gene expression at the University of Porto in Europe as well as the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He did his postdoc at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, where he focused on RNA biology research. Rashid joined Ambry Genetics in 2014 and currently is the director of Ambry's Translational Genomics Laboratory, dubbed the ATG Lab. With that, welcome, Rashid. Thank you, Michael. So, uh, full disclosure, I am a full-time salary employed at Ambry Genetics. So, in today's uh, webinar, we will be uh, discussing RNA sequencing, and I will provide a definition of RNA sequencing, and uh, also we'll uh, make a, uh, provide some uh, some literature uh, uh, that I believe that it's interesting that, that provide interesting uh, examples of uh, uses of RNA sequencing. And uh, we will also evaluate using RNA sequencing in genetic testing, and I will end this webinar with a clinical case, an exome clinical case. So just so we are all at the same page, I think this, uh, it, it's important uh, to, to make it very clear uh, the, the overall uh, central dogma of molecular biology, right? I'm quite sure you all know this, but just uh, let, let's re uh, review this. Uh, so, as you know, as DNA codes for RNA and RNA codes for protein. 
And uh, I, I think that, that that's a concept that is very well understood. Uh, just some major issues here uh, in this process. Uh, it's not as simple as, as, as described. Of course, uh, there is a lot of complexity uh, underlying uh, what, what happens uh, in between this process of prescription and translation. And here, and here is just to exemplify a little bit molecularly uh, how this happens in, in the cell. So you have the double-stranded genomic DNA in the nucleus, which he has, uh, as you know, an axons and introns. Uh, uh, the coding sequencing of genes uh, being the axons and the non-coding sequencing of genes being the introns, right? And in all this, it's uh, transcribed. So you have the transcription start site. <clears throat> it's transcribed into a, a pre-mRNA. So the pre-mRNA is a sequence that it contains both coding and non-coding sequences. And then uh, that's uh, also known as the nuclear RNA. And uh, this pre-mRNA, then it, it's processed uh, further on, on what we call RNA splicing. And RNA splicing, what it is, is, is that the cell is able to recognize uh, what are the intronic versus the exonic sequences using aid from several different uh, 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 well-established sites, for example, canonical donor sites, canonical acceptor sites. Uh, to, to recognize where the coding and the non-coding sequences are, and it will remove then the introns, uh, leaving us with the final mature mRNA. And the final mature mRNA is then exported to the cytoplasm, where you have a translation of the mRNA by the, the ribosomal, uh, and in the end, you will have a, 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 the protein, and the, pro the protein being the, the, the functional block of the cell. Uh, splicing, well, of course, all these steps, they have uh, numerous layers of complexity uh, and regulatory networks that, uh, th th that, that impact those, uh, uh, those processes. Uh, I will, since today we are focused about RNA, uh, I will go a little bit deep, deeper into uh, uh, splicing. And you can see here, this is uh, an overview of uh, splicing events. One thing that is important to understand is that splicing uh, happens naturally. The vast majority of genes have introns and then they, these introns are removed during the process that we just described, splicing. But uh, why do we have splicing to start with? And in part, uh, we have splicing because the splicing is a way, for example, we have around 25,000 genes uh, but we know that we have more than 100,000 uh, uh, protein products being produced in cells. How do you reach that diversity? And splicing is a way that uh, it's one of the ways that you can reach that diversity because one gene doesn't necessarily code for a single protein. One gene can code for multiple different proteins uh, thanks to, alter to alternative splicing. And alternative splicing happens normally in the cell. And, uh, but also uh, may happen in, in disease. Uh, and in, in, this, in disease, of course, we will not be calling this alternative splicing, we would call it abnormal splicing, but by having DNA changes in some of the, 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 the codings, in some of the regulatory sequences may impact the, over, the, the outcome of the mRNA product, which may result in, in disease as we will discuss this further. And this is just like some uh, example of what, what the authors here call some basic alternative splicing patterns, which includes, for example, axon skipping. So you have the entire axon, the entire portion of the coding sequence being skipped. Uh, uh, you, you, you may have, for example, alternative uh, you know, splice sites or cryptic splice sites being used, right? You may have intron retention, so a portion of, of the intronic sequencing is retained. You may have alternative first axons, alternative last axons, and, and this is just the basic alternative splicing patterns. It is a very complex process, and you know that this may get even more complex when you have like multi cat uh, axons being skipped. You may have inclusion in, in, in skipping of axons happening at the same time, uh, and you see important how the cell decides what's being included, what's not being included in the, in the message, 
it, it relies a lot on 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 uh, regulatory elements. For example, intron splicing silencing, silencing elements, intron splicing enhancers, exon splicing enhancers uh, that are that are all uh, uh, DNA sequences where uh, ribonucleoproteins bind to and and will help to model uh, to modulate uh, splicing events downstream. Another uh, important uh, concept that we, that, that, that we will be discussing today is nonsense mediated mRNA decay and MD. I will be calling it MD from now on. Uh, as you know, uh, as you probably know, NMD, uh, it's, it, it's, it's believed to be the major mechanism behind uh, loss of function alleles, right? You have an allele that has uh, a premature termination code on the PTC, uh, uh, that allele uh, now we know will uh, result in an unstable mRNA that is degraded by NMD. And, 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 and that's important for us to understand why a loss of function allele is so deleterious. It's not even only because you, you, have, you have a predicted protein truncated, but most important is because you, because you don't expect not even to have an mRNA product uh, to start with, right? Or, or at least a downregulated RNA product. Because of NMD, so NMD will be downregulating the, the, the mRNA, and, and any subsequent uh, 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 mRNA that is left over, for example, for example, would still be truncated. It could be uh, degraded by other quality control mechanisms in the cell. Uh, but overall, what is important is that we know that a lot of functional use that include nonsense, a use that contain nonsense variants, frame shift variants, and splicing site variants, and splicing events. That result in out of frame transcripts, they all result in uh, in up insufficiency, right? Uh, as opposed to to the normal allele that is uh, regularly uh, transcribed, spliced, and translated. So, what's RNA sequencing? So, RNA so RNA sequence is a very broad term. It can apply to a multitude of different uh, approaches. So basically, RNA sequence method typically consists of identification of suitable biological samples, isolation of total RNA, enrichment of non-ribosomal RNAs, conversion of RNA to cDNA, and then a construction of the, a fragment library that is then processing for sequencing on a high throughput uh, sequencing platform. Usually, uh, nowadays, this is equivalent to next generation sequencing or massively parallel uh, sequencing. Uh, to generate single or pair end reads that will be aligned uh, and assembled uh, on, for downstream analysis by bioinformatic pipelines. So there are many utilities uh, for RNA sequencing, uh, and here we will start focusing more on its uses in, 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 uh, uh, in, in medicine, in disease. Right, so some of the utilities of RNA six, so it can be used for transcript, uh, transcript discovery, for example. So you can figure it out uh, for uh, what genes, uh, how the genes are expressed, if they have alternative isoforms, and what's the relevance of those isoforms. It's also important, and it has also been used quite widely to to perform uh, make, uh, studies of mechanism of gene regulation and of disease. Uh, a very Another common approach that we will be discussing in more detail, uh, uh, you can perform differential gene expression analysis using RNA sequencing. Specifically for disease, I think one very important use of RNA-seq is alternative splicing analysis, and we will be discussing that in, in more detail. Uh, the same applies to allele, allelic specific expression analysis, which is another important use of this, uh, that, that this technology allows us to, to perform this type of analysis, and I will provide an example of this too. And this also allows us to detect, increase the clinical sensitivity of genetic testing by uh, uh, detecting uh, alterations that would not be traditionally detected by DNA testing only. And then two examples of this type of alterations, one is gene fusions, and the, another type of alterations are variants uh, 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 deep intronic variants that would not be traditionally detected by 
by uh, uh, DNA testing. And I will provide an, uh, a, a clinical example of a deep intronic variant in the end of the talk. So uh, it's just for you to understand, so the RNA sequence strategies, they, they start with a tissue, right? Uh, blood or a tumor tissue or a normal tissue. And, and the first step is to isolate RNA from that tissue, and, uh, and this is very important because RNA is unstable. It's a molecule that's different from DNA that is a very sturdy molecule. RNA is unstable, and it, require, it, it, and, uh, it requires to be pro uh, processed uh, properly. And, uh, and once we isolate RNA, uh, not all RNA molecules are the same, and, and that's also something important for us to understand, that there are many different types of RNA molecules the most abundant of most of them all is the ribosomal RNA that is uh, uh, represented in pink here. For you to have an idea, the ribosomal RNA is about 98% to 99% of the total RNA that you uh, uh, that is uh, present in the cell, right? And uh, also here you have an example of like a mature uh, mRNA. And uh, you have like the, the pre-mRNA, the one that it has not been spliced yet. Uh, and you also, it's important to say that you also get a uh, genomic DNA uh, or endogenous DNA every time you try to isolate, you isolate RNA because uh, this is just, uh, we, we can never really get rid of all the DNA. But these are, are some important points uh, with, with regards to the sample preparation what you get when you are uh, isolate RNA samples. And then from those samples, from, from this sample, then uh, you, there are many different approaches that you can uh, use to study uh, 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 any downstream process. Uh, and, and here is just like what would happen if you would just go and sequence uh, total RNA, right? What would probably happen is that the vast majority of your reads, they would align to ribosomal RNA, because as I mentioned, ribosomal RNA is the vast majority of the RNA in the cell, right? And that, uh, that's why when you're doing RNA sequencing, you need to use uh, uh, enrichment, or you, uh, you need to enrich somehow the, the, the RNA that you're really interesting, interested in looking at. One way that you can do this is by performing a ribosomal RNA uh, depletion or reduction. So you use the method that to get read of all that ribosomal uh, 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 RNA, so then you have, uh, so you you can use the technology of RNA sequencing to focus on uh, on, on other targets. For example, like in green here, the 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 uh, highly expressed genes, for example. Another approach that you can do is it, it, that you can go for a poly A selection, right? So as you know, uh, you, as you may know, the uh, Genes that are expressed mRNAs, they have uh, poly A tails. So you can take advantage of, of genes, the genes that are expressed having poly A tails and capture those mRNAs using a uh, poly A uh, selection. And that will also uh, end up giving you an overview of, uh, of of the overall genes that are being expressed in that in, in that in that cell type. And then uh, uh, another approach that it's been used is it's, uh, cDNA capture, or uh, also uh, also known as a targeted uh, uh, RNA approach, where you actually will you have probes that will capture uh, the specific gene uh, mRNA from specific genes that you are interested in analyzing. So these are just uh, uh, so virtually no one does total RNA because uh, it doesn't really make sense because you would be uh, wasting all that sequencing power with ribosomal DNA, but those three other approaches are, 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 fa are fairly common approaches that are used uh, with, for example, uh, if they will result in different uh, uh, studies. Uh, for example, if you're performing whole transcriptome sequencing, right, for whole transcriptome sequencing, uh, usually uh, the approach that is used to enrich your RNA it's the ribosomal RNA because you are interested in every RNA for whole transcriptome, not only the coding ones, but also non-coding RNAs, right? So you get rid of the ribosomal, but every other RNA species is still available for you to sequence, 
uh, Polye uh, the approach is usually used for uh, gene expression. If you really, really wanted to be looking at genes that are being expressed, you don't really care about non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, and, and other RNAs, uh, uh, species that are not translated. You only want to look in RNA, mRNA. Then a poly A may be the best alternative if you look, want to focus on, on, on differential expression. And then finally, captured, it works better if you actually have uh, um, uh, genes that, uh, that, that, that are many not as abundant, uh, with limited transcripts, uh, and you really want to focus on a subgroup of genes that you know you are interested in studying it. So the capture may be uh, the best approach in that scenario. So, uh, so, so this is the intro to uh, like overall view of, of RNA sequencing, and now I will provide some examples of, of its applications. Uh, uh, the first one being differential gene expression analysis. So here, with, when you talk about the DEG, differential gene expression, what, what we're really asking is at what level a gene is being expressed, right? So you can, comp of course, you're always going to be comparing to something. And then in a tumor, you may compare the tumor with normal tissue. And then uh, let's see an example like a, a BRC1, you'll be looking at the expression at the level, at what level BRC1 is being expressed in the tumor, versus as a normal tissue. That's one a, a, a basic example. So uh, I will provide some literature here. So if, obviously if, uh, uh, we can only superficially uh, address all these issues. So I strongly recommend if you are interested in, in, in any of the, 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 those topics to go forward and read the, the, these papers. Uh, I believe they are very interesting reads. Uh, so this is a paper that was uh, just published this year at Intel, but was a very cool paper, it's pathogenic germline variants in, in the approximately 10,000 uh, adult cancers. So this is a, uh, we, we, the CD, it, it, um, with tumors, right? Uh, and, and here, it's a good example of, uh, of how you can use RNA sequencing to, to measure gene expression, the overall expression of a gene. And you can see uh, the, in A and B, that's where we will be focusing here. They, uh, for example, you have several different uh, uh, tumor types. Uh, 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 for example, ovarian, uh, lung, uh, thyroid, skin cancer, sarcomas. And then uh, compared to that, you have the expression level for genes with uh, germline variants. So you have the mRNA expression in the, the gene with, with, with a germline variant. And, and one thing that I think is interesting to, to what this data told us overall is that you can see here uh, what, what uh, we were discussing initially that we, we believe and we know and this provide evidence for that, that what happens uh, actually with tumor suppressor genes, the mechanism of disease for loss of function, it's uh, usually that these genes have Tumor suppressor genes they will acquire, or, or in the case of germline variant, uh, uh, the, the gene carries a, 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 a truncation or, or uh, a premature termination cousin that will result in sense mediated decay, which will significantly reduce the expression of that gene. And that's exactly what you can see here for a variety of tumor suppressor genes, APC, ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2. Uh, and so forth, uh, that you, uh, uh, genes that contain germline variants will be, uh, are usually fine to be downregulated uh, uh, in tumors. So I think that this provides a very strong foundation for one of the, the, the pillars of, of molecular genetics, clinical molecular genetics. As you know, like HCMG tells us that if you have a truncation variant in a tumor suppressor gene, in a gene that Loss of function is the mechanism. You can apply a very strong criteria to to classify that gene uh, as uh, that that variant as pathogenic, and it, that's in part because of this knowledge uh, that we allow to do that. This is another example uh, of a paper that was published last year in Nature uh, that I thought was also very interesting. They used RNA seq to look at for gene expression in in in, in, in metastasis. So they, they look at several different metastatic uh, 
samples, so tissue analysis, and they perform RNA sequencing. And one of the things that they came out, so pretty much like then you can, you, you can look at what's abnormally expressed, and then you can take uh, have a better idea of what type of pathways are involved uh, in these tumors, and you can use this information subsequently to either develop uh, uh, diagnos diagnostic tools or, or guide treatment. And here, one of they develop like a, 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 a prognostic score using RNA sequencing that they believe they would be a good tool. They claim would be a good tool for uh, to use. Uh, uh, for, to evaluate patients for possible use of, of immunotherapy. So they come up with like a immune profiling. They look, they use RNA seq to, to look at, uh, at, at the uh, gene expression of uh, immune genes and, and then they create uh, the, the, this immune profiling. And, 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 you, you, and, uh, and they compare this immune profiling to expression of, 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 of uh, the PDL1, which is it's a very famous target. Especially now, like last week, you you may have heard uh, Nobel Prize went to the uh, to, to the teams that discover uh, uh, that, that proposed immunotherapy as an alternative to, to treat cancer, right? And you can see uh, 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 that, that there is also a clinical correlation with uh, the, the, their score with the clinical uh, uh, their score with the immune profile that they are proposing. But this is just to give you an example of. of how this technology can be used. Another uh, way that you can uh, use RNA sequence is for allele specific expression analysis. And, and I think that's a very interesting use of, of RNA sequencing because it pretty much allows you, uh, especially for genetic disease, to look at each allele independently. Right, for most uh, autosomic genes, we have uh, two copies of the, uh, of the gene, and then uh, you may, if you look at only differentially gene expression, you only be, see the gene being downregulated, but you cannot be sure if the downregulation is being caused by the uh, by the premature termination codon, for example, by the allele that has a truncation that has a mutation uh, 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 versus the one that is wild type. One way that you can do to, to, to look at alleles, allele expression individually is to using allele-specific expression analysis, and RNA sequencing allows you to do that. So one interesting paper that was published in, at, on science in 2015 that has used RNA sequence to perform allele-specific expression is this one. I also think it's a, it's a very interesting paper because uh, it, it actually uh, it gave like a, a very uh, a broad look at the impact of uh, of variants that have uh, premature termination codons, the impact of those variants on, on, on a new specific expression, right? So they use the GTAC samples and others to to, to look specifically at, at the impact of, for example, nonsense. Uh, single nucleotide vari uh, variants or frame shifts or splice sites to look uh, and, 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 and to see the impact of these alterations in the allele specifically. So not on the overall expression of the gene, but uh, the expression of the allele specifically. And, and, one, and then here is it's, uh, one, of the, the, the pan one of the figures in the panel where you can see the proportion, for example, in A, you have, uh, comparing to synonymous, for uh, alterations, uh, you have nonsense that escape an MD and nonsense that, that would result in an MD, and you can see that you have a, a, a this is pro showing the proportion of variants with uh, with a little specific imbalance, uh, 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 in, in, in the nonsense ones, uh, as expected, are in the, uh, are in, uh, you have more allele imbalance on those alterations, and the same thing here true when you compare this with indels, in-frame indels. So in-frame events, they do not result in MD, right? Because uh, you obviously you don't have a, 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 a you, don't sh you don't change the reading frame. So you, you will not have a, 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 a premature termination column, which is usually the outcome of, of uh, out-of-frame events that results from frame shifts, right? So you can see here uh, that yes, frame shifts that trigger an MD 
you have a higher proportion of variance with allele specific invalid. And then, uh, so, mo but most of the uh, for for the remaining uh, for the remaining 25 minutes of the of the talk now, I want to focus on uh, this is specifically utility of RNA sequencing alternative splicing analysis. But I think differentially uh, differential expression it, it's very it's it's very important, especially for research and discovery. Uh, but but it's still uh, we, we don't know clinically what to do. For example, what do you do if you see a, 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 a down regulation of BRC1, BRC2, or, or any other clinically actionable gene with a patient without having a DNA variant? It's kind of like we don't really have uh, guidelines or we clinically don't really uh, would have any management uh, for, those, for those patients. The same thing with allele-specific expression. You can prove that one allele is being downregulated or shut down, but without an underlying cause of or a mechanism of why, uh, it's hard to, to provide clinical management to patients. So RNA alternative splicing analysis is uh, of, of the of the approaches that we will be discussing today, the one that we are already using clinically to guide uh, 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 patient management. And I'll provide a few examples. Uh, here as well. So uh, this is also on that science, science paper. Uh, it, 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 it's just to show uh, like an overview on the cases that they look, they, that they analyze uh, of, of the impact of splicing, the, the impact on the splicing on variants that are located on 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 the on, on splice sites on those re regulatory regions that are important for splicing. And here you have uh, the donor splice site, variants that are located in the donor splice site. You, you, you can see that it's specifically uh, variants located in what we call the plus one, plus two region that is highly concerned virtually the 99% of the introns will restart at the position plus one, plus two with a GT. So this is a very well conserved position that you can see that, uh, uh, that, that HCMG also allows us to use uh, uh, just based on the knowledge of how the deleterious these alterations are, allows us to, to apply uh, 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 very strong criteria on when uh, classifying loss of function alterations in, in, in located in this position. They, they are predict that they have been shown to disrupt splicing by, by, by the, in this paper as well, but in many others. Uh, and you can see here by that by a uh, uh, splicing analysis, this is a more broad landscape type of, of, of display. Uh, so just to give you uh, uh, an overview of like the, the, uh, a significant proportion of variants that affect the plus one, uh, plus two position will result, for example, in, in uh, axon skipping, shown in orange here, or uh, in axon elongation or intro inclusion. Uh, showing green here, or in a mixture of events as show, show, showing gray. So th this is what, something that I always say when uh, uh, the, the problem of predictions, right? If, if you show me like a variant that affects plus one, plus two, I can tell you that we probably result in abnormal splicing, but I cannot tell you, neither in silico two can tell you what exactly the pro mRNA product will be. Right, uh, and that's uh, for, for example, you cannot tell if you have a plus one if you will end up with axon skipping or you if you end up with uh, inclusion of intronic sequence, for example. Right, the only way you can obtain this type of evidence is by performing uh, RNA analysis and if you're using RNA sequencing splicing analysis, that, that will tell you, for example, if the axon is a skip, uh, and if the axon skip is in frame or is an out of frame product. Uh, skipping. These are all important pieces of, of, of information uh, uh, that, that are required for us to do the proper variant assessment. In RNA sequencing, splicing analysis of RNA sequencing data can do that. And another type of alteration that is very important clinically are the, the, the minus uh, one, minus two alterations, the acceptor splice site, right? The acceptor splice site, there are also the canonical positions that are also extremely well conserved, minus two being an A, minus one being a G, and virtually also a, a high proportion of the cases that result
results in a, in, in, in this in disrupt uh, that can just do disrupt splicing uh, the same way with the donor sites they may result in a, in a vast in, in, in different outcomes different type of transcripts um, uh, action skipping intro inclusion for example right so these are also important important alterations and then here uh, uh, no surprise that those plus minus one two uh, because we understand them better, because they are so highly conserved, uh, you can see here the conservation as well. Uh, this va variance in these positions will result in, 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 in variants that are usually classified as uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic, and that's what you see here in G, the number of clean var variants reported for those uh, specific sites. But a lot of, of, of Things that are in other sites are not as well understood. For example, uh, the impact on, on, on variants on the last nucleotide, the, part, the impact on, on, on splicing of variants on the last nucleotide, or a plus three, plus four, or plus five, these are also variants that have are also relatively well conserved, uh, uh, that have been shown to result in abnormal splicing uh, as well, but that they are clinically not as easy to, 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 to understand, and many times they ended up being classified as VUS or variants of a non-significant, uh, exactly because of uh, our inability to understand this, these alterations. And RNA sequencing provides us many times with this evidence, so it can tell you at what type of abnormal splicing it will result, and that can be used as evidence to classify alteration. If this is a great example of like, so here, uh, the previous slide, we were looking at summary of all those cases that this paper included, right? So it's, it's a very broad uh, perspective of what's going on uh, with splicing. And I think that that's a good summary of, of, of overall. But then uh, let's look at uh, a specific example and, and how this can actually be applied clinically. And, and I'm, I will use this example uh, it is a BRC1 plus 5 alteration. So you can see here plus 5 are almost usually a G. Uh, so it is well conserved, but not as well conserved as plus 1, plus 2. So plus 5, uh, they have the potential to result in abnormal splicing. They are dangerous alterations. Every time I see a plus 5, I also kind of like a trigger like the, the clinical red alert. Pay attention to this variant. But it does require that you perform RNA analysis to properly classify those alterations, right? And CMG doesn't really give you any clinical, uh, doesn't allow you to use any clinical criteria to classify a plus five, other than in silico. So in silico, it's abnormal. Uh, as in splicing predictions are abnormal in silico, you can use that as supporting. Doesn't take you anywhere but from a at, at a US. For this specific case, we just also recently published this case uh, in Frontiers in Oncology. Uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good example here. You have this plus five alteration that was classified as VUS. We collaborated with Rutgers here, and they send us further uh, uh, RNA samples for testing. And you can see the, the uh, uh, for DNA and RNA testing, and we you can see the variant comes from the paternal side of the family, which makes sense because uh, uh, we have strong family history of breast cancer on the paternal side. With breast being diagnosed at 33, 50, and 24, and 25, and, and this is uh, then we we had the sample and we performed uh, uh, whole transcriptome sequencing. That's what you see here in B. So whole transcriptome sequencing. Remember, uh, it, it, this is blood, right? So we had blood samples uh, from this from this patients. And what we did, we did uh, ribosomal depletion. So remember, like that approach, we got rid of all the ribosomal RNA. Uh, and we so ended up only with uh, the non-ribosomal RNA. And then we, you can see here, uh, uh, the way this is called, this is the output of, of, of the data. Uh, th these are called sashimi plots. And here in California, it's lunchtime, so I apologize if you didn't have time to eat the lunch. Uh, but yes, this is not how I call this, this is really called sashimi plots. And, 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 and the way you can, you, the interpretation of this data, is pretty much like every read supporting a splicing event, it's counted here, right? So you have uh, the, the tuna uh, one is the, the proband with the plus five, 
and you can see on top the wild type splicing event. So this axon uh, goes here and goes here. Uh, and you can see, the, although, that it does result in abnormal splicing as well. Uh, you have 14 reads uh, indicating that this axon will skip, axon 18 will be skipped. So you will just result, result in abnormal transcript lacking that, that axon, right? Uh, uh, and, and whole transcriptome is an approach that has been used by many labs to do, especially academic, academic labs mostly, to do uh, a variant assessment. A traditional approach that labs use uh, uh, are PPCR, uh, reverse transcriptase PCR. Uh, you can also see uh, the abnormal splicing uh, event here. You can see the proband. It results in abnormal band compare, compared to the mother and sister, uh, which are uh, uh, wild types, so they only have the wild type transcript. The father is positive, so you also see abnormal, abnormal transcript. And, uh, and we also use a, lympho, uh, a cell line that we, we got from collaborators from a plus one position, same splice side, to show that it did result in, 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 a, in a similar abnormal splicing. The problem with our TPCR is that you cannot really quantify and you cannot really tell what the product is. So you need to do uh, RNA sequencing the old style here we did. And that's how we, we used to do RNA sequencing in the past. You used to clone uh, the RNAs uh, uh, and then you would do Sanger sequencing in each of individual clones. So that's why we have here Sanger sequencing of clone transcripts. And, 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 and that's important to tell you exactly what it is. So these three pieces of evidence were all showing us the same, that this plus five does result in skipping of axon 18. But the challenge here is uh, 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 RT-PCR is not quantitative. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not qualitative as well. Sanger sequencing is, is semi-quantitative, but uh, it's qualitative, but it's not high throughput. In whole transcriptome sequencing, it's challenging, especially on, 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 on a clinical setting, uh, on a clinical lab, because you really virtually analyzing the whole transcriptome of a patient in blood, as in this example here. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, you re really want to only understand exactly what this variant is doing. So you're sequencing the entire transcriptome uh, when we could just be looking at this specific alteration. That's why we develop a technique that it's also an RNA sequencing approach that we call clone seq. Uh, pretty much clone seq, what we do, so we get RNA from the patient. Uh, we isolate, uh, we isolate RNA from blood, we isolate RNA. We do our TPCR, we clone those transcripts, and then we, uh, we will do, we do uh, RNA sequencing or method parallel sequencing from, uh, of the, of the, of all these products. And, 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 and then we send this bioinformatical, uh, uh, and this uh, is analyzed by our bioinformatic pipeline, and that will give you qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, results. But the most important thing here is what this will really give you, and that's what my next slide shows. It's a high definition picture of what a specific variant is doing. Uh, and, and that's the, the, what we're really interested to know in this specific patient, right? So, so here I put side by side uh, how the, the whole transcriptome sequencing looks compared to, to, to our approach, uh, clone seq. And you can see here, uh, uh, as I was telling you, uh, the, the tuna one is the proband, that whole transcriptome sequencing was able to identify 14 reads showing abnormal splicing. When we do our clone seq assay, instead of 14 reads, now we have 11,000 reads. So obviously that gives you a much more confidence to perform a quantitative analysis uh, of, of those uh, abnormal spli uh, of those uh, splicing variants. And you can see here both problem and father. Uh, uh, you can see here the abnormal splicing rate clearly. And you can see on the control subject, the, the sister and the mother, you only see the, in the, in the salmon color here. You can only see the normal uh, splicing events on top. No abnormal splicing at all. And, and, and so these are the absolute numbers. So it provides you absolute quantification. So you have the absolute number of reads, and then you can do relative quantification. And we call this the PSI. So the, 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 the proportion of splice, splice
price index events, and that tells you at what ratio those uh, uh, th those abnormal transcripts are being expressed. And you can see here in red that the, the skipping of 18 is highly expressed, approximately 40% of the overall reads, the overall transcripts are uh, are these abnormal transcripts. So altogether, we use this the RNA evidence, the clinical evidence. The, the the in silico evidence and, and to reclassify this alteration, this plus five alteration from the US to likely pathogenic, which had an impact on the clinical management uh, of this patient. And then uh, uh, here, uh, uh, another approach, and I think this is more like a summary. And I think uh, ideally, uh, molecularly, the more you do, the better. So I think the point I wanted to convey here is, is that uh, the ideal pipeline, you would analyze all those components at the same time, right? Uh, it is important to say that uh, they do require independent pipelines. Everything that you want to look at, uh, at the rna seq level, you will require a specific calibrated pipeline. It's just not like, oh, okay, this is the sample, do RNA sequencing now, tell me this, tell me that from, no, you actually need to run the same sample into different pipelines uh, to be able to get the specific results you are interested. And I think this was a very interesting paper that was published last year that, uh, that looked uh, on, uh, on muscle disorders, right, that, uh, that with unknown cause. So th th this was a cohort of people that had uh, muscle disorders with a, a, a known cause uh, after performing exome analysis. So this is, is, is a, was, if, I, if I recall correctly, this is from the Bro Institute, this, this paper. And, and uh, one thing that they did that ideally it, it's how it should be done, you have a muscle disorder, you are analyzing muscle tissue. And I think that was very important for the success of, of this, this specific project, right? So they were able to get muscle biopsy, the muscle tissue from those individuals, uh, and then they did uh, RNA sequencing on muscle tissue. So they isolate the RNA from muscle. Uh, and then they uh, 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 did a multitude of different analysis on, 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 on those muscle, uh, on, on muscle tissue from these people with muscle disorder. Uh, and, and, and the outcome was that they were able, and here we have the sashimi plots again uh, from this paper, showing that they were able to identify in several cases uh, abnormal splicing events. So we have on top, you have the, the, the wild type uh, controls with only the normal reads, and then you have on the bottom here uh, the abnormal uh, uh, reads, and here it's specifically the skipping of this axon. So this axon is being skipped. Uh, so that was one alteration that was identified uh, uh, through through their uh, through, through their uh, uh, scheme. And, and here is another. I, I think this example is very interesting too because it conveys that idea that we can using uh, RNA sequencing we can detect uh, things that DNA sequencing, including exome sequencing, would miss. For example, like a deep intronic alteration that result in inclusion or insertion of a cryptic axon. That's exactly what you were seeing here in this uh, sashimi plot. So it's a DMD variant that was identified deep intronic. You have the, the wild type people, uh, you have the wild type uh, individuals only having normal splicing, and then you have the abnormal uh, the individuals where the variant was identified here that activated the cryptic axon, and then you can see the reads here in the showing. The, the, the cryptic axon. Uh, and now to conclude, uh, we, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I just want to provide one of our uh, a clinical case uh, from our exome cohort. Uh, some of you may know uh, that uh, last year we, 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 we performed an exome negative whole transcriptome sequencing project. Uh, and and uh, so pretty much what we did was uh, patients that have performed uh, exome sequencing with us, that they were negative. We uh, request additional blood samples to perform whole transcriptome sequencing, right? And, and this is one of one example of an alteration 
that was characterized uh, using uh, this, this approach. So in, UB, uh, in UBPL, uh, it, it's a gene that encodes an iron sulfur protein, also known uh, as the nucleotide binding protein like, which plays a critical role in the assembling of the mitochondrial complex one. Mutations in this gene cause a rare form of mitochondrial complex one disorder, which is inherited in a recessive fashion. Uh, and uh, and I, I would like to highlight here the clinical features associated with complex one deficiency. Uh, they are very heterogeneous and they include encephal encephalopathy, epilepsy, uh, ID, ataxia, dystonia, hypotonia, muscle pain, uh, uh, among others. So very uh, heterogeneous clinical presentation. So uh, we identified uh, th this family uh, using whole exome sequencing. And you, here you can see several family members were tested. Uh, and uh, so, so they are compound hats for this meat-sense alteration that, was, that it was classified as, uh, it is classified as pathogenic. Uh, and we also identified a deep intronic uh, minus 27 alteration that, uh, that it was predicted to affect the, the, the branch point, uh, which is another element on the acceptor's donor site that, is, uh, that, that, that can affect its splicing, but very rare, but can affect splicing too. So we identified this alteration also uh, uh, in, as a compound hat in the affected individual. So you, you have a uh, Affected individuals now segregating with both alterations here, the Q affect the probe and then the sister. And then you have unaffected individuals being uh, hat for either for uh, one of the alterations or the other. So we perform whole transcriptome sequencing in blood. And this is the challenging I was telling you. You're looking for the entire transcriptome. Genes may not be highly expressed in blood. The thing is we did detect uh, both in the proband and in the affect, affected sister, uh, abnormal transcripts. But we were just not confident at all, uh, at all with uh, just a couple of reads to make any conclusive remark. So what we did next, we run CloneSys, uh, our approach that gives you that high definition uh, uh, a picture of the splicing abnormalities. And then here we were able to show that this minus 27 branch point variant does result in abnormal transcripts. You can see here in two, the two new ones are the, the, the individuals that are positive for the minus 27. It does result in skipping of exon 10. You can see here the reads showing to skip, skipping of exon 10. And it also will result in inclusion of a portion of the intron, so activation of a cryptic acceptor site in the intron. Uh, so overall, disrupting is splicing, especially when compared to our uh, the modern the system and the other controls. So this evidence was used to demonstrate that this branch point alteration was abnormal, resulting in abnormal transcripts, which is uh, important because uh, this is beyond reporting range for pretty much most labs would not be reported without additional evidence. Uh, and also branch points are very rare alterations. This, is, to my knowledge, is one of the few that I'm aware that have been functionally demonstrated to result in abnormal splicing. So I thought that was a cool, uh, uh, a cool example of uh, of a variant that was characterized using RNA seq approaches. So now we're reaching the end. Uh, summary: RNA seq is a versatile technique that encompasses different approaches. So and it's important to remind you that different approaches will measure different outcomes. And then here we show, I showed you today differentially expression approach, uh, the allele specific expression approach, and the in, in, uh, RNA and splicing analysis uh, approach. And uh, overall, all these approaches, individually or combined, uh, I strongly believe that they can improve genetic diagnosis of Mendelian disorders. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic presentation, Rashid. It's exciting to see what RNA sequencing is going to do to uh, the, the genetic testing and diagnostic field as we progress. Um, now we're going to open up the floor to some questions. Um, again, if you do have any questions, please type it into the question box um, and we will review them as time allows. 
Um, so the first question that we received, uh, can you perform RNA sequence analysis for hematological cancers? Yes, you can. Uh, in, 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 there are many examples in the literature that have been shown that. Uh, in, in a way, uh, the, the issue will be like a hematological disorder sometimes it will be to obtain a control, but yes, it's possible and it, ha it, and it has been done. Question number two, if we find a mutation by RNA sequencing, can we rule out that it is from the pseudogene and is in the actual expressed gene? So uh, every time, and, and that's the approach we use for that variant that I show in the end, uh, uh, every time you show something on transcriptome sequencing or RNA sequencing overall, uh, uh, you, I, I, especially if we're talking about a clinical variant, right, a variant that is going to be reported to the patient, uh, uh, it's imperative that we always do a combo of RNA with DNA analysis. So RNA analysis is very important to be used. I think we, the way you should use clinically, RNA is, should be used as evidence to classify alterations, but it's not something that should be reported to the patients. So I would only report to the patient something that we can confirm and identify on the DNA level. So you would have to use a, 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 an approach on the DNA level to differentiate the pseudo gene versus the gene to really establish that yes, the variant it's in the gene, and that's what it's causing the abnormal splicing uh, event that you are then finding by RNA sequencing. Great. Well, it seems like we've come to the end of our allotted time. Um, there are a few extra questions on the, the board. Uh, we will address them, and we will get the responses out to you via email that you provided for the webinar. Um, so we would like to thank again Dr. Rashid Karam for taking the time to give us this overview of RNA sequencing.